Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see you today. Hope that you are blessed and favored and encouraged today. And we're looking forward to what God has in store for us all this morning. And uh, I ask you to stand with me this morning. Let's worship God together for a little while. Everyone needs forgiveness. I need something. 
needed this morning. I apologize to those watching online. I have no idea why that song wasn't showing up like the first one did. But uh, I'm still working out bugs and trying to figure out how this system works sometimes, it seems like. But uh, today for announcements, I'll share with you a couple of quick things. Um, today is BGMC Day, so I hope you brought your BGMC money. If you don't, we take checks and cash and all that kind of good stuff as well. But um, appreciate you giving to BGMC. Network 211 benefits from that and uh, helps spread the gospel all over the world. They do it through a website directed toward military. They have one that if you go online and you search and you're Googling and you're trying to find out, what I feel depressed, what can I do? A website from Network 211 will come up there in some of the early results. And they'll help you know Jesus above everything else. So it's a wonderful opportunity we have to help spread the gospel, and that's what our BGMC money does. Next Sunday is um, Mission Sunday, or next Sunday is Mother's Day. And um, I'm trying to decide what I want to do here. I thought of something I'd like to do, like a Mother's Day brunch during Sunday school hour next week. Um, how many of you ladies and families this morning, and it's, it's not just moms, of course, it's everybody's going to eat. We're not going to make you come and just mom eat, and y'all watch mom eat. That'd be kind of cruel. Um, might be a little funny to some, apparently, but... Um, anyway, some of y'all are laughing right now, and I'm like, uh, that's not the spot. The, 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 you shouldn't be laughing right now. But how many of you, but just raise a hand, how many of you would come next Sunday morning at 930 for a Mother's Day brunch for moms? I think that, 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 that seals the deal right there. So we will have next Sunday morning at 930. I will be preparing for you a, a few odds and ends and things. So this ain't going to be just, just, just uh, maybe ask the question after this. This ain't going to be your biscuits and gravy Easter breakfast with all the extra stuff. It's going to be pretty simple and pretty, pretty, pretty good. It'll be, it'll still like some quiche type stuff or frittata type stuff. And I've got a, got found, I saw a recipe this morning for some, um, they're called beignets. I think that's French for biscuit. But anyway, it's, uh, and it probably may be funny. It'd be funnier if it, even that's what it actually is. But anyway, uh, I'm going to make some of those and make probably some frittata type stuff, and uh, it'll be a good time. So plan on coming, and even if you don't normally come to Sunday school, we, we, we want you to come and be a part of this and be with us here uh, next Sunday morning for Mother's Day. This is a five Sunday month, so our fellowship will fall on the 30th, which is Memorial Day weekend. My nephew, Josh, uh, will be with us that weekend, and I've asked him to preach for us that weekend. He's getting ready to go to Dallas Theological Seminary. And um, I told him a while back, I said, you, get, you feel like you're ready and you want to, I'll let you preach. So I'm not sure he's preaching anywhere else, but he's going to preach for us on the 30th. And I know you'll, you'll uh, enjoy that. He'll bless us. And we're looking forward to him being with us on the 30th. But next Sunday's Mission Sunday, so bring your missions offering. And bring mom to church. That's, you know, that's, that's a good policy to have on Mother's Day. Uh, we encourage that highly. And uh, we won't have a Sunday night service next Sunday night because on holidays like that, we only have Sunday morning service and then... Everybody does family stuff and, and what have you on the evening usually, so uh, we encourage that and want you to do that. So this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, we ask you to continue your prayers for uh, the needs of Lori's body and life. She has a, uh, uh, some tests coming up here that will give her some answers, but pray, pray blessings for Lori for the touch she needs in her body and life today. And um, beyond that, I don't have any updates of anybody that's on the list or anything else to share with you. I will ask you again to pray as I did on the, the church prayer page. A uh, special unspoken need for a family uh, connected to our church for protection and just a, it's, it's a very serious situation that could become a devastating situation. We're trusting God to bless them through it. So uh, just unspoken for that one. I don't, I don't even want to tell you the family. It's just better if we don't. So uh, anybody else have something to share with us this morning or update? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Remember Amber this morning that she needs in her body. Anybody else? Anything special this morning to, to lift up and believe God for? All right, if you wouldn't mind, stand with me once again this morning as we take these needs to God and believe Him to bless and touch these circumstances and have His will and way. Father, I believe today for your touch for Jerry, and we're looking forward to hearing good news for her. Touch Debbie, God, today, body, mind, and spirit, and bring your providence to her life. Bless Nolan. Touch Amber, Father God. And Lord, I believe for healing and restoration, and Lord, that your touch would come for her fresh and new today. Bless Shirley. Touch Louise and Tanya. Lord, I speak blessings over Craig and over Loretta Lee. Over Becky Hoshaw and Brianna and Doug and Gail. Bless Isaac and Jeremy today, Father God. Speak your blessings over Laura, over Lori and Mark. Bless Pam and Patrick and Robert and speak your blessings over the unspoken need on Dee's heart and life. Lord, I pray for the family that I have on my heart today, God, that we agree today for your providence, for your protection. Lord God, that you would bring salvation to those who would seek to do harm that they would understand, Lord, more than anything else, how much you love them and, and that you would help them to overcome their feelings 
and the issues that are before them. Speak your blessings, Lord God, over this church family. God, I believe you to speak life, peace, and strength today. Lord, you know today the burdens that we carry. You know today the heartaches and the pains, body, mind, and spirit that we experience. Lord, I pray for financial blessings for this church and church family, that today by your Holy Spirit we would know the fullness and the fruition, Lord God, of your will and way and your promise and power. I speak blessing today, Lord God, over our community, over our state and country, over our president and leadership in Congress, and Lord God, over our governors that are represented in this church and over our local authorities and our cities and our county. And Father God, we ask your blessing, Lord God, today, especially over our schools and these remaining weeks of classes, Father, that your blessings will continue to be shown on each and every campus and each and every child, student, teacher, administrator, Lord, and bus driver over these days to come as we finish out this school year in the next few weeks. We thank you for it. We honor you for it. And look forward, God, to testimonies and blessings of your goodness, grace, and mercy and give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's worship you together for a little while before we get to our word today. I'm having technical issues and I apologize, but I had to do that. Let's focus our hearts now and worship Jesus. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood
We're going to live this one of these days. We'll be in glorified bodies. We'll know everything we ever wanted to know. We'll be gathered around the throne singing this song to the Lamb directly. Sing a song without doing anything but just your voice or your heart. 
It don't have to be loud. It just needs to be honor to him. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I honor you. Thank you for life. Thank you for hope. Thank you for peace. Thank you for joy, Lord, that we have in our hearts today. In spite of this world and all its troubles and trials, God, we have joy. We have love. We have peace. We have victory today. We have victory today in you, Jesus. No other way that this world can know anything but outside of what you've done for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for hope today, Jesus. Speak, God, to your children this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Kids Church, Miss Carly. Round them up. Take them out. Go. On. Get. Remind you again next Sunday, if you don't have Mother's Day lunch plans, run for the sun. Uh, CMA's having a fundraiser over at the Buzz Cafe. Big old full hot buffet of wonderful food that you can go and enjoy to support CMA and run for the sun. It'd be a great time. I encourage you to do that if, if you don't have other plans. God is good all the time. I tell you what, we're living in a troubled world. That's not a revelation or news to anybody, but I'm telling you, in spite of it all, in spite of it all, God keeps on doing what he does because that's, well, who he is. That's what he does. And I'm so glad this morning that we have what we have in him. We have the life and the hope and peace we have in him. And I know that while we look sometimes and wonder what's about to happen or how can things get worse, even if they do, so what? Even if they do, it doesn't matter. As long as we have our faith in Christ, as long as we hold on to him, our victory is in him and nothing else. And uh, the, the government does, does some things that are good and right and wonderful, and that's not going to save me. And my mom and daddy did lots of things to make me who I am today and help me be the, the man that I am today. And your mom and daddy helped you to be the men and women you are today. And some of y'all still being made. And I'm, I'm 52, I'm still being made. But uh, anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what we have. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. Nobody, nobody has done anything for you like Jesus has. Nobody can do anything for you like Jesus does and is yet going to do. And I'm just telling you this morning, it's time for us to rise up in faith and power and strength and to overcome ourselves because that's our biggest enemy and our biggest fight, which we've been talking about. And I'll kind of kind of bring that up again a little bit this morning as we lead back into our subject, our, our discussion today of living in victory. Living in victory is a, is a series that the Lord laid on my heart here a few weeks ago that deals with the issues of our life because the phrase spiritual warfare gets thrown around, it's thrown around like, like crazy. And spiritual warfare is, it's a misnomer when you come down to it. The idea of spiritual warfare that most people approach and a lot of preachers will approach, and I may have said things over the years that kind of lead into that that could be a way, but the idea of spiritual warfare is is I'm in a fight with the devil. The devil's attacking me and I'm fighting him. And we've talked about this, and I'll go back to it for just a minute here in a few minutes, but the, the revelation on this, and this is not new, this is just taking what the Word says and actually applying it to our lives. This is not, this is not really even revelation when it comes down to it. It's a common passage we read all the time. But the idea that I'm fighting against the devil tooth and nail, and then every day I'm in a fight against him, is not necessarily the reality that we're all living in. Now, does the devil fight us? Of course he does. That's his job. But I'm going to show you and tell you again today, as we lead into where we're heading today, he's defeated. He has no power over you. He has no authority over you. As a matter of fact, in Christ, we have authority over everything. There is nothing that the enemy can bring against you that you unless you allow it. Now, I'll make sure you understand here. Now, I'm not just telling you this morning that if you'll just love Jesus, everything's roses, and that's just wonderful. But that's not how it works. That's not, that's not reality. That's not, that's not the truth of God's Word. The truth of God's Word is, is what we're going to find in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, is what I'm going to read to you again here in just a minute, because that's our key and central aspect of what we're talking about, is that what we're actually overcoming and what we're actually fighting and battling against the majority of the time is ourselves. Because when it comes down to it, only you, in your own choices, choose sin or you choose righteousness. 
You choose to be wishy-washy or you choose to be firm and solid in your convictions. You choose to do foolish things or you choose to do wise things. You make the choice. Now, peer pressure, even, it, I don't care how old you are, peer pressure still, still happens. Now, should it happen like it, like it happens to a 13-year-old? No, but does it? Yes. How many people? I'll give you a perfect example. January 6th. There were people there with the right heart, right attitude, and right mindset. They wanted to be heard. They wanted to go down to the Capitol and make sure that those representatives and senators heard their voice saying, we don't like the way things are being done. But then, some of the rowdies and some of the criminals Kick, in the, kick down the gates, go start busting out windows, and wind up in the very place that is privileged to even get to go as a guest, let alone to go in there like they did, and invade. Now, saying you're invading the people's house, shouldn't, that, shouldn't ever be, that just shouldn't even be a phrase, but it is. There's security, there's all the things that you have to get permission, you have to show ID, you have to go in there the way that you should go in there. And in the very process, one young lady was shot because of what she was doing in a criminal way. The very idea. But how many people, good people, wonderful people, who just wanted to be heard and just wanted to stand up for liberty and for freedom and for democracy, were in that crowd and ended up where they had no business being, doing things they had no business doing, acting the way they should not have been acting. For I don't care what the reason. I don't care if there was legitimate proof that the election was quote-unquote stolen. And you may still feel like it was, and maybe you think it's all over, it's all over and done regardless. Even if they did, it's done. I don't. I, I honestly don't know. I really don't know. Now, was there underhanded stuff? I, I promise you. But there's underhanded stuff in every election. I'd bet somebody that, that voted for George Washington shouldn't have voted for George Washington. Shouldn't have been allowed to vote, okay? That kind of stuff. Underhanded stuff happens all the time. It just does. And there's jokes I could throw right there, but not time or the place. Uh, if you want to hear one, ask me later, I'll give it to you. But I'm just telling you, and it's not really that funny, but it, I mean, it's just some of the irony stuff. But I'm telling you something. Peer pressure exists today, and I don't care if you're 13 or 30 or 50 or 60. It happens. And how many of those people would have never, never done anything like that? But, man, the crowd's moving and going, and they got caught up in it, and there they were. So it happens. But they have nobody to blame. When they stand before a judge, they can't say, well, everybody else was doing it. Yeah, but you did this and this. Here's pictures of it. Here's your own cell phone. Lord, my cell phones are a wonderful thing. But... How many people have gone to jail because of their own cell phone? Some of them cause somebody else's cell phone, video what they're doing, which is good when it happens that way. But there you are doing criminal things, and you're videoing it. I remember hearing, seeing videos a few years ago where you'd see some kids out playing, um, playing mailbox baseball or something stupid like that and videoing it. It showed up. It was like, well, the judge didn't have to look very far for evidence. There it is right there on your own camera, like on a VC, you know, VHS camera or what have you. And... You know, dumb stuff like that. People have always videoed dumb stuff as long as there's been video. And they, uh, they, they run audio of dumb stuff, you know, Watergate. Uh, whenever, you know, and you're recording dumb stuff back then. It, it's always happened. When there's been something to record, people have recorded stupidity and wind up getting themselves in trouble. But how did they get there? You know, how many kids have got caught up in all kinds of stuff? Kids got caught up in all kinds of stuff because, well, everybody's doing it. Of course, the parents' line, mom's dad, mother's dad's coming up, father's day in a month. Well, if everybody, if all your friends are jumping off a cliff, would you, would you do it too? Some of them, I promise you they'd bail off of there. Well, hopefully there would be some water underneath there. But, but, uh, and, and we had that. Matter of fact, I jumped off a cliff that I shouldn't have jumped off of into the lake, but it was too high and too far, and it was peer pressure. And I was only 13 at the time, but still. I was a hero for a minute, and there's people, you know, I'm telling you something, if you ever decide you're going to do something crazy, like that, like jump off a, a high bluff into, into the water at, the, at Lake Norfolk in Arkansas, uh, White's Bluff to be specific, go ahead and climb on up there and jump. Because if you don't, on a nice summer July day, people see you up there and boats will stop. And I spent 30 minutes talking myself into making this jump. Now I'm talking, this is, it was probably 75 to 100 feet. I mean, it's a, it's a high lee. It's a, it's a ways up there. And I'll just tell you, I, I climbed up there, and I've, I've jumped off those bluffs lots of time, but the water was a little lower than normal. And from the top of the bluff, you might get a 50, 60-foot jump on, on, a, on a normal time of the year. But, but the water was a little lower, so I climbed up there, and my idiot, my idiot brother's friends, and I mean that with all the love of my heart, my idiot brother and his idiot friends, let's get them all covered there. They, 
they, they dared me. You won't do it. Well, you can't dare a 13-year-old hillbilly to do something. He's going to do it. So I climbed to the top of that bluff. And I stood there. And I kept looking down and thinking, this is going to hurt. And I said, I don't really want to do this. And it's going to hurt my feet, among other things. And I, don't, I just don't know if I want to do this. And I, I got up there. But then the climb down, if I slipped and fell, would have been a lot worse than me doing it on purpose. So I had, I had all this going on. Well, while I'm processing all this and dealing with all this, boats are, that are running skiers and pontoons. And there's like 50 boats that have gathered out there now to watch this idiot jump off the bluff. And I'm just... And it got to the point where, where Doug looked up at me, and, and uh, he's one of my brother's twin friends, and, and I, I'd like for Doug to see this at some point, but Doug looked up at me. Doug looked up and said, you've got to go now. <sighs> Deep breath. Then he started counting. I'm telling you, peer pressure. All right, on three, Jim. You ready? One, two. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. This went on for this, 30 minutes. And people are gathering. I've got an audience. And I hit the water. I jumped. I finally just, without anybody counting or anything, I just said, let's go. And I jumped, and I, I made myself as, as, of course, I was a lot slimmer then. I, I was only about, I was only about 200, like 200 pounds, uh, 6'1", 200 pounds at this point. So I, you know, I was bigger than a lot of people my, my age. But anyway, I was still, I was, I was solid then. I wasn't, well, biscuits and gravy like I am now. But, but I, I hit the water. And, and I, won't, I, won't, I won't detail what happened, but there were a couple of things that hurt pretty bad. And it was, I come up and it was like, oh, I was grunting. I mean, like I come up and there are people shouting and cheering everywhere all around. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I got up in the boat and I, and I commented on what I felt and, and Doug was like, oh, you'll be okay. It'll be fine. And I'm like, yeah, you go jump and tell me if it'll be okay. It'll be fine. But what, what made me do that? Non, why did I do that? Peer pressure. It, it, did, it, did it hurt me? No. Physically, I, I mean, it, it stung for a little bit, but I was fine. And, and you know, I, I, did, I didn't have any injuries where I, you know, needed to go get checked out or whatever. But have to do over again, I wouldn't have even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it. I'd have climbed up 30, 20, 30 feet. We did that all the time. That was normal. Uh, we were doing that time. We were six, seven, eight years old. I mean, that was just a normal thing. But this time, I went clean to the top, and I was, you know, feeling tough. Of course, there was a girl in the boat that I was trying to impress. That, that was part of it. But but uh, boys will do a lot of dumb stuff to impress a girl. And uh, grown men that's been married to the wife for 30 years, 33 years sometimes will do some dumb stuff. But anyway, we don't have to talk about that now. I've told enough stories for this morning. Let's, let's move on before, before it gets worse. But Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. Let's, let's go back again and see what this says. We, we read this a couple times, but we're going we're gonna to stick here for a little bit until we at least get to the whole armor, and then we'll, we'll maybe transition for our starting verse there. And you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, have made, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of a requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And here's our key right here. Having disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Father, Touch us today through this word. Help us to see and know and understand, God, something today that will impact our lives in a way, Lord, that nothing else can. Your word is true. Your word is powerful. And I pray this word, Lord, to help us today in a way, Lord, that, that brings us some light, brings us some understanding, and more than anything, helps us to live our victory the way that you have for us to live it. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. So what Paul gives us here in Colossians, just to remind you of where we've been, because we had a week off last week with the with Teen Challenge being with us, and they did such a good job, and thank you for giving a generous offering to them. But, you know, disarmed principalities and powers. Now, let me remind you here, in case you, you haven't been with us for these, just to give you this. When you take that word disarm from the original Greek that Paul uses, this is not just saying he, he took away his weapons. This means he stripped him clean bear has nothing he is naked and has nothing he can use against you whatsoever N has nothing at his disposal to retaliate to bring harm to you to hurt you to deal with you to do anything against you because he has nothing to use except except and i link it together with what with what the word tells us that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom, whom he may devour now again i'm, I'm just going to give you the bare bones of this part of it because i've got something fresh to share with you today out of out of 2 Corinthians, but, but I want you to think about this and understand. 
that the issues you have in your life, when you are tempted, that is a temptation that comes against you, that the enemy may or may not be behind, regardless, that's not, it's not the issue. The issue is that he has nothing he can use against you but you. And I've said this a couple times recently, and it really, it really ha- hammers it home for me, uh, and hopefully it does for you as well, that what the, enemy, what the enemy is doing, when he does do anything against you, he can't touch you. He cannot lay a, a filthy, whatever hand you think of as the devil's hand, he can't touch you. If you're in Christ, he cannot harm you and touch you personally directly. He can't do it. But he can make you think he is doing something. He can convince you that you have something to be afraid of. He can convince you that you are in danger. He can convince you that what he says is right and true. He can try to convince you and try to get you of the mind where you're thinking that you're in trouble, that you need to be afraid, that you need to be, that you need to be frightened of what he's doing and what he's up to. And the good news is he has no weapons, he has no authority, he has no power, he has been stripped completely and totally out of, out of anything and everything he can use against you except for, really when it comes down to it, all he's got to attack you with is words. And he's good at that. I'll give him credit where credit's due. He's good at that. He can convince you that he is a roaring lion about to devour you. He can convince you that he is a threat and he is a problem. He can convince you. But if what he is trying to convince us of is reality, then Jesus' work on Calvary's cross is incomplete. Because if I can still, if I can still be attacked with some weapon that he has used on on believers for centuries past before the cross, and he can use something against me in a way that would harm me physically, spiritually, emotionally, or any other way, then Jesus' work on the cross isn't everything the word says it is. And it has to be thus. It has to be so. That he has no power, has no authority, has nothing. He has nothing. He makes you think he has something. He makes you think that he has power over you. And the church for 2,000 years has preached on and talked about spiritual warfare. And we have the idea that we're just we're in a fight with the devil. Even though there's so many places the word says no. And I'm going to show you another one I'm here in a few minutes. But, but leading into this and kind of laying the groundwork here for where we are is to understand that the enemy has no power over us. As a matter of fact, in verse 15, he said he's made a public spectacle of them. Again, the imagery of this is powerful. And I go back to where I was the first week, and I think I even shared it a little bit two weeks ago. But understand this. The public spectacle, he's put them on display for the world to see. Imagine a battle goes on. And the winning army has their prisoners of war and even the generals and captains and maybe the leader of it all. And they bring them in and they march them right down Main Street and say, look at what we did. These guys are powerless. That We've defeated them. We have stripped them clean and bare. And now look at what you, what you have to be afraid of. Nothing. Woo, come on now. There's the spot right there. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to fear, nothing to dread. We have nothing to look at and say, oh, no, the devil's up this morning. It ought to be the opposite. It ought to be the opposite. I can't remember exactly how to phrase it because I heard some. I think it's part of a song somewhere, but I also heard another preacher say it one time. It ought to be when you wake up in the morning that heaven says, hallelujah, he's awake, and hell says, oh no, there they are again. Because we have the authority and power in Christ to defeat anything and everything he throws at us because he has nothing to throw at us. Now, the one issue that I run myself into, just, and I talked about this before, but I've got to throw it up here because your brain may have already went there. When he says we have our shield of faith with which to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, well, there's a weapon. How, where do you get darts? No, we don't have, it's not, it's, it's, it's symbolic. It's those little lies and those little, little suggestions and those little temptations and that little junk that he's shooting at you. And your shield of faith, faith will fight that stuff off. And I'm getting ahead of myself because that's, that's, that's well down the line from where we are now. He's disarmed. He has no authority, has no power, has nothing to use against you but his own fear tactics, his own stuff to try to convince you that he can do something. And he can do nothing. And I believe, I believe the battle, as we talked about last time, two weeks ago, the battle is within ourselves. The battle is, is within us. The words war or warfare does show up five times in the New Testament, only five. Now, that shocks people. That surprises people. And I think I looked around when I said that two weeks ago, and I'm like, and a few people are like, well, are you sure? What are you talking about? You know, 
Two weeks ago, I talked about this, and I went into detail. I'm not going to go into the detail of it now, of course. I, I can't preach this every single part, every part of this every week. Just give you the, kind of give you the cliff notes of it here. But the spiritual warfare that he's talking about in every occasion has to do with your own heart, your own life, your own decisions. The strongholds and bondages that, that exist there because we place them there. Or we've let the, or what, and here's where the enemy comes in, where we have let him place there. But even a better example is something like this. I was a drunk. I was a fool. I was lots of things when I was living in sin. And now here I am living for Jesus and a pastor and a husband and a father and a grandfather. All the things that I am as a human being here at my almost 52 years of age. And what the enemy would like to do is to rip up my past and throw it right in my face. Well, who are you to be up preaching to these people? Who are you to tell somebody how to live when you ain't figured it all out yourself yet, boy? Who are you? You're drunk. Just because you ain't drank in 20-some years, that don't change nothing. You're still a drunk. You're still, you still have bad thoughts. You still this, you still that. You, you, know, you ain't much different than you were 30 years ago when you gave your heart to Jesus. So you know what? I'm a blood-bought child of God. I know who I was. I know what I was. I don't need you to tell me because it comes up. It's part of my testimony as far as that goes. I brag on Jesus using that trash that he tries to throw up in my face. And I'll just tell you, I'll just tell him something further. I love this thought and this idea. You know what, I may not, I may not be what I was. I'm not what I was, and I may not be where I'm heading yet, but I'm going to tell you something. I know the end of the story, and I know what's going to happen to you, dude. You're going down. You're going down hard. You're already defeated, and one of these days you're going to be put in your place once and for all. God's giving you a little bit of rope, and you're trying to hang us with it. And I got good news for you this morning. He, can, he can't hang you unless you let him hang you. It's your choice. It's your decision. It's your, it's your desires that are going to keep you on the right track of righteousness in Christ or that's going to drag you down into junk. But it's your choice. It's your decision. And all this warfare that, that people write books about and want to talk about, that warfare is, is not the right mentality and right mindset necessarily because the fight is within ourselves. The fight is, most of the time, my struggle, my trial, my, temp my issue, my dealing with temptation. And when I surrender to temptation, I have let him win, even if he wasn't the one tempting me. Come on now, where's that at? What if the temptation is just my weakness and my, my lust and my desire to do something? He still wins if I let him, if I do something that, that, that he might otherwise be the author of. So we have to get our mind made up. And we have to decide that what the Word of God says is true is 100% bona fide true. So here we go. Here's where we go today. And I'm going to give you this. I'm going to run through this fairly quickly this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to be looking at verses 3 through 6. Now this is familiar. We hear this all the time. As a matter of fact, some of these people who want to use, who want to talk about spiritual warfare, they'll throw this up here all the time. And they'll, they'll talk about how we are fighting against the devil and we're doing this against the devil and all that kind of stuff. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Our, our enemy is still the devil. But he has no weapons. He has no authority. He has no power. You know, if, if, our, if we as a nation ever go to war again before the tribulation, Armageddon, all that kind of stuff, if we go to war again, we will have armies that will come against us with all kinds of fortified this, that, and something else. And we have all kinds of fortified this, that, and something else ourselves. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure with the, with the technology we have and some of the things you hear once in a while, that our, our military, as well as other militaries around the world, have got some weapons that are terrifying. They got stuff that'll hit you with sound waves. They got stuff that'll hit you with, with something you can't even see, don't even know what's going on, you don't even know it, you just feel it when it hits you. And that's not movies, that's reality, that's truth. There's some stuff out there these days that if we go to a war and any of that stuff gets used against, against anybody, it's going to be wow. I promise you, there's stuff that, 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 just, that, that is incredible. You know, I'm not talking about the Avengers movies. I'm really talking about something real. Avengers movies, that's some of that stuff come to light. I'd, be, I'd find me a hole to hide in. I just promise you it would. It's, it's terrifying. But I'd want a shield. I'd want to have uh, Captain America's shield. But that's, a, that's, again, that's a whole other thing. And, and I can't have it because it's not real. Um, Anyway, so, so let's, let's get in here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to spin myself off. I ain't real careful, and I don't need to do that. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Here we go. 
Here's, here's where we're going to we'll focus for a few minutes today. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, this is one of the passages I believe we used a couple weeks ago. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, there's the key right there. Remember that phrase. I'm coming back to it in just a minute. Are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Again, think about that phrase, knowledge of God. We're talking about what we know and how we know it. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Where's your, where, the key word there, thought. Again, I'll be back to that in just a few minutes. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I'm fixing to give you something here this morning that's going to touch you hard if you'll let it. If you'll, if you'll focus here just, just, just for the next few minutes with me. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down stronghold. Three words here that I want to focus on for the next few minutes. Weapons, warfare, and carnal. Weapons, warfare, and carnal. First of all, we do have weapons at our disposal. They're spiritual. You find this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 18. This is the, the, shield, of faith, the shield of faith, helmet of uh, salvation, breastplate of righteousness, and so on. We're going to talk about those in detail in weeks to come. But for today, I want you to think and understand. He says the weapons of our warfare. Now this word warfare is the, the, the Greek word root of that is the word stratos, where we get the word strategy. Follow with me here. Now, this is good. This is really good. And some of this is Rick Renner, and some of this is Holy Spirit. It's kind of a combination of both, because I've got a Rick Renner book that I'm, I'm reading, and a lot of this stuff is just really slapping me right between the eyes, because this is already where we were headed. Uh, I talked to Sharon about this a few weeks ago, because I always run stuff by her, and just where my heart is and what I'm thinking. And then I started reading this book, and I'm like, wow, God, your timing's pretty great that, that, uh, that this works together like this. It's really awesome. So stratos is strategy. Now watch this, that word warfare. So let's think about this. The weapons of our strategy. The weapons of our strategy. You have to have a strategy. Those that have served in the military here, those, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're, whatever you're doing in your life. Trying to raise kids, you better have a strategy. If whatever you're trying to do, you need to have a strategy, have a plan. And here's the issue that so many people don't have. They don't have a plan. They don't have a strategy. They don't, they don't look at the situation and say, okay, well, here's what we ought to do. Here's how we ought to do it. I mean, Jesus gave the example that who's going to build a tower and not count the cost and not figure out what it's going to take to get it done. Otherwise, you're going to get halfway done, run out of money, run out of resources, and you look like a fool because you didn't get the job done. We have to have a strategy. And we have to have something to look forward to, something to, a goal and, a, and a mind, you know, something in mind that carries us through, right? So, then he, so this, this comes in powerfully because he says that we have to have a divine strategy, which is God's word. God's word's our battle plan, however you want to phrase that. And if we have weapons but no battle plan, our defeat is assured. Now, how does that work out? We all know we need to pray. We all know we need to read our Bibles. We all know we ought to be in church. We all know that we ought to, we ought to worship God. I don't care if you listen to Air, you know, Air One or K-Love or, or My Bridge or whoever, whatever, driving down the highway, you can worship Jesus for that. My favorite song right now is Child of Love. If you hadn't heard it, look it up. It is powerful. It's good. You can find it on YouTube. It's a wonderful song. I love that song. If I could find the split track to it, I would be singing it worship or I'd sing it for a special. But I love the song. I love the, the idea of it. It's just fantastic. And anytime that song comes on, I am just, I'm, I'm driving down the highway worshiping Jesus and and I, one hand on the wheel usually, my eyes are open, but still I'm doing it. And, and you know, the, the, the reality of this thing is that I'm a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, I have, I have my, my whole life is covered. You know, we talk about, we used to talk about uh, the hedge around us. God's put a hedge around us. Well, if you've got a hedge around you because you're in Christ, you've got your front, your back, your sides, you're covered all the way around and there ain't nothing the enemy can do against you because he ain't got nothing to do anything against you with. And that's the power of it. So, this, the, the reason that we look at this and we don't experience the victory that we need to experience in Christ so much of the time is because we don't have a, we don't have a strategy. We're not using the weapons of our warfare, in not, not even effectively, we're not using them at all. There are so many Christians in the world, and I hope our church isn't any of them, but if they are, listen to what I'm saying to you, that you don't pray regularly, you don't pray every day, you don't pray, you, you don't pray unless you're in church. So, you know, statistically, it's possible that the most recent the time that you did any serious praying was about 30, 40 minutes ago when we prayed on this prayer list. Why? Your greatest, your greatest weapon that you have to build yourself up and to fight against anything the enemy brings against you is prayer. And tied with that equally is the word. When David says, your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, 
There's a reason you need that word, because that word will guard you and help you and develop you and, and bring you into that place of obedience and faithfulness. And I'm going to come back to that, too, in closing this morning. We talked about obedience there just a minute ago, and that's, that's a powerful part of this. But if we don't have a strategy, we're going to fail. You think about it, go back to our military there a second ago. And I won't, I won't, I won't put anybody on the spot here. We, I mean, we got a couple military folks in the room this morning, served recently, one of them. But, but you know, if, if you're just taking... And you're just, you're sitting there and you're just, you know, maybe you're sitting in a tank. I'll just, I'll just throw something in there that's just, just random. You're sitting in a tank and you're just saying, you know what, that looks good. Shoom, boom, blow something up over there. That looks like a good spot. Let's shoot over there. Boom, blow that up. Let's shoot, you know, just randomly shooting out, shooting out shells and doing what you do. Well, so what? You might hit something that matters and you might not. You may do harm to something that shouldn't be, have harm done to it. All kinds of stuff may happen because you're just willy-nilly shooting, just doing whatever. But whenever you've decided, you know what, that's a target I need to hit, and I'm going to hit it. That's an issue that I need to deal with, and I'm going to deal with it. That is, a, that is a circumstance right there that I need to deal with. That is what I need to do. You watch these movies, and some of the movies are movies, and some of, it's, some of it's Hollywood, some of it's real. But, and I'm not even going to look up or ask a question. I'm pretty sure, I, I do think this is something that's right, because one of them I saw was a, a real deal. But they, have, they put a laser on something, a laser, a laser deal. And they, they said, we're going to paint this target. And they're going to paint that target. And what that means is that somebody somewhere, whether it's from a plane or from wherever, whatever, they're going to paint that target, and they've got a laser-guided missile. When that, that laser is on that target, and that missile comes from wherever it's coming from, it's going to pinpoint, hit that target right on the money. And it's going to destroy whatever it is that they're putting that on. And, uh, and that's, that is a strategy. That is something effective. That is, I mean, that's hitting right exactly where you need to hit it, laser-pointed, laser-guided, right down to the deal. I've heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, I'll ask, I'll ask the man that, that would probably know this, that if they wanted to hit just the bathroom over here in this other wing of our church, that they have a, the ability, through the technology they have, to be able to run that missile into this building, into the, into the right spot where that's going to be the primary de destruction point. That kind of stuff exists. It's there. And strategically you use that. Strategically you use those kind, of, those kind of weapons in real military battle because that is what you want to hit. You don't want to drop the whole building sometimes. You just want to hit one, one part of the target. Well, I'll just tell you this morning, there are times in your life when your prayers need to be directed and focused in a pinpoint laser fashion that is going to bring the glory and the power and the majesty of God more than just saying, Lord, bless the situation. I'm talking about getting right down to where the rubber meets the road. Lord God, I am believing you by the power of those stripes you received on Calvary's cross that you would heal and deliver and work and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, sometimes it just, Lord, just bless them. That's going to cover it all. But sometimes you've got to get down right into the middle of the situation. And really believe God for something powerful. And really believe God that by strategically that you're going to rip down the devil's lies and deceptions and that you're going to bring, bring closer and better the obedience to the, to the call of Jesus Christ. That you're going to do everything you can do. The enemy has convinced the church for 2,000 years that he has power, he has authority, that he's against them and he's doing stuff and it's all a lie. It's all a lie. He has nothing. He has nothing. And if you're in Christ, he has nothing on you. I used that illustration a couple weeks ago. Here's a good spot for it again before I move on. That, imagine you're in a courtroom. This is a Carmen song too, by the way. I like old Carmen. I, it's, it's, it's sad that he's passed, but he's, he's, one of, he's, he's one of those, when I first got saved, man, he was big and everybody's listening to those cassettes. Carmen cassettes. My wife had several. Carmen cassettes. She introduced me to Carmen. I like Carmen a lot. But it's a whole courtroom scene, right? And you've got the, the, the prosecutors, the devil over here, and he's spewing out all of his... All his, and let's, well, I, love this, I love this aspect of it too. Now he's a liar. He's a liar, amen? But sometimes what he's saying is true. Now let's approach it from that angle. He takes me in court. And the prosecu as the prosecutor, he can look at me and say, absolutely, he's a drunk. Absolutely, he's a womanizer. Absolutely, he's lustful. Absolutely, he's this and he's that and had a foul mouth and, and wouldn't pray with his eyes closed. He had all those things going against him. And he brings out all of his charges against me and every one of them is 100% true. Bonafide, absolutely true. And I would probably be in reality, I'd stand there and hold my head, I couldn't even look up, I'd be afraid. I don't want to see nobody, I don't want to look up. But then Jesus, my defender, steps up and says, that's all true. But he's asked me, 
and I've forgiven him, and the record's clear. It's over. It's done. You have nothing on him because the price has already been paid. The penalty's already been enforced, and there is nothing left for him to do because I took it all on myself. And God the Father, if you can allow me such latitude, the judge says, case dismissed. Welcome home. That, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly the kind of stuff we're talking about here. We don't have to be afraid of what the enemy is saying, whether it's true or whether it's lies, whether it's deceptive or whether it's the real deal. If I'm in Christ, I am free. If I am Christ, I am victorious. And I can live in that victory if I choose. Now, this is the tough part right here. This is where people get messed up. If I choose to live in my victory, I'm going to live in it. I said if I choose to. It's my choice. I can go around defeated if I want to. I can go around believing the lies if I want to. I can go around letting him, letting him get over on me all I want to, but I don't have to. I don't have to because in Christ I'm free. Because in Christ I am victorious because he has nothing on me. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now watch this word carnal. You probably know this word carnal. Carnal is the flesh. Carnal is the flesh and blood, who I am, what I am. Now here's the really important part of this, part of this message. Carnal has to do with your flesh. And what Paul is saying is, is all of your weapons that you do have to fight with are not, are not fleshly. You can't take a sword out and bust the enemy with it. If you've got whatever gun you want to throw out, pistols and shotguns, whatever, I don't care, it doesn't matter. There are no weapons, no weapons that you have of this world that matter when it comes to dealing with what the enemy is doing. There's nothing you can do in the flesh. It's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual weapon. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is offensive and defensive, which is one of the most important aspects of what we're going to talk about when we get down to that point. It is. It is using what God has given us spiritually to be victorious over the junk of this enemy. And friends, I'm telling you something this morning that's really important. We have to get, our, we have to get it in our hearts and minds that we are victorious in Christ that we have to live in this victory and living in this victory means that we cannot be defeated now you think about this we're going to get up a basketball game and one team is going to be Michael Jordan David Robinson, Charles Barkley. <laughs> I can't say his name without laughing. That dude's so funny. Charles Barkley. And let's go ahead and throw in LeBron James. And for old time's sake, Larry Bird. I got to have me some Larry Bird. I love some Larry Bird. When I was a kid, I thought it was funny to shoot. I'd, I'd, I'd shoot and pull that ball behind my head and try to try to Larry Bird. I can make one once in a while. Usually it, it hits the ceiling. But... Larry Bird, you know, we got those guys. All, some of the all-time greats. Some of the best to ever play the game. Then and now. And the other team, me, Tabby, Kelly, Dan, and Hunter. Is that five? Doesn't really matter. All of us. <laughs> Just everybody. Everybody in the room and those watching online. You can play too. Everybody, y'all can, can come too. And we're going to play those five guys. They are going to beat us in every way that you can be beat. My wife said, even at the age they all are now, they're going to beat us in every way we could be beat. They're going to beat us. They will beat us shooting. They'll block every shot. We, will, we might not even get a shot off. I'm talking, I'm talking this, is, this is how bad this is. If we get a shot off, it's going to be one of us shooting from half court, and they don't expect it. That's the only way we're going to get a shot. And they may block that one. I mean, I'm talking about we are, we're going to be out. I mean, we're going to be outclassed in every way possible, okay? Every way possible. We cannot win. That mentality is how people approach their spiritual life so much of the time. I just can't win. I'm so weak. <laughs> I'm so pitiful. 
I don't know why I can't do that. I can't. Oh, poor little me. We have our pity party. I've been a few testimony services before where you left and you thought, you thought, man, that's so sad. Testimony time ought to be, man, I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Jesus loves me and I'm going to heaven. Thank God for what I have in Christ. But I've been in services before. Don't have time to tell one of them. It's, it's worth telling, but I don't have time today. It was, it was funny, honestly. Just understand that if you ever go around like Phil Donahue with some of you younger folks, I have no idea who that is, but just most everybody will. You go around a room like Phil Donahue with a group of people and you start asking for testimonies, be careful what you wish for. We had blood spurting. We had gushing. We had throwing up. We had several things. And, and after those, and one of my, and here's my big mistake. I got the gushing blood, and then as I made my way back around, she said, oh, I had another one. And I went back, and then we had projectile vomiting. And my, all, of, all of my youth, I was a youth pastor, and pastor was out of town, and, and me and the associate thought this was a great idea. And it was a good idea overall, and, and it was really well received when it was all said and done. But my youth asked me when, I, when we went to McDonald's that night, I think it was McDonald's or Mazio was one of the two, probably Mazio was more likely. Why did you go back? Why did you go, after what she said the first time, why did you go back? But I've heard, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I want to, I want to kind of go here just for a second and I'm going to finish up. But it's like, the testimony is, oh, the devil's been on me so hard, I'm just, I'm just wore out. <laughs> oh, y'all pray for me. And they sit down. Number one, that's not scriptural. And if the devil has been on you so hard, so what? I don't care if he's trying to ride you like a horse, he's trying to get the saddle strapped on. He can't. He has no authority unless you give it to him. He has no power unless you give it to him. And we've got to decide to live in victory. And for way too long, for most of 2,000 years in some way, shape, or form, the church has been convinced that they are, they are under attack. And we're really not. Even if we are, there's nothing he can do. Now, I said the thing I went a while ago. I, I, I'm coming back to it. We need to go into that situation where we're up against, let's just go into it with the mindset and the understanding, you know what, not only, not only are we going to win, we can't lose. We cannot lose. It's impossible for us to lose. And if we'll come, up, come at it from that angle and that mentality and that mindset that says we cannot lose, we can't lose. We cannot lose. Unless we choose to. Ooh, right there, that gets people fired up. I've been there. Have you been there? Have you ever had a situation where you knew you shouldn't, but you did anyway? I'll, be, I'll confess that I've done that. I've been in a situation like that before. And I'm like, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to. We do it all the time. Even, and this is not necessarily sinful, and this is what I'm going to say. You ever have a conversation with somebody? Well, I know I shouldn't say this, but. Whatever you said after that, yeah, my wife, my wife just gave a better one that, that really hits me. I know I shouldn't eat this, but, but I'm going to. But, folks, that's, those are cute and those are funny. And, and actually, you know, it, it, that is some of that fun irony there. But how many people have been at work and been flirting around and flirting with somebody and then, Next thing you know, I know I shouldn't go home with you, but my spouse has not been treating me good anyway. We've been fighting all the time. We this, we that. Some other excuse we give ourselves. Because here's the thing. I understand this, and this is this 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 this, this fits so often. Now this is this is sometimes humorous, but most of the time a situation of sin it's not. It's never in sin. Excuse me. Never okay in sin. Just, I didn't say that the way I wanted to. When you use that little conjunction, but. Most of the time, whatever comes after that is you trying to excuse your behavior. I know I shouldn't say this, but. And everything you say after that is probably going to be trashing somebody or something that you shouldn't be trashing or ripping up. I know I shouldn't, but. But then it comes to sin. We've got to have sense enough not to even start the conversation. I know I shouldn't, go, I know I shouldn't drink this, so I'm not going to. I know I shouldn't, but I'm, and so I'm not going to. Instead of, I know I shouldn't, but. 
because that but somehow our excuse. Somehow that allows us some freedom that we shouldn't be allowed to have. And that little conjunction that gets thrown in there, the enemy's sitting back like, oh, come on, say it. I know I shouldn't, but because whatever you say you shouldn't do, you're going to do because you're justified, because you're angry, because of this, because of that, because of something else that really is nothing but an excuse and a license for you to do something you shouldn't do. Say something you shouldn't say, act in a way you shouldn't act. And friends, that is not who we are designed to be in Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. While we live in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. We fight in the heavenlies, and most of the time that fight is within ourselves. Where we're trying to convince ourselves it's okay to do something because we're justified, because I'm mad, because of this, because of something else. The enemy, enemy has convinced you it's okay for you to be mad. They've done you dirty. It's okay to not forgive because they've done you wrong. It's okay to be sold up because God's word says forgive. God's word says love them anyway. God's word says to be obedient. Let me come back to that part of the verse in closing this morning. Verse number six. So they can pull it back up here and find it. Let me see. Let me start Let me start right here in verse 5, it should be. Bringing every thought, now watch this, I was going to talk about this, and I don't want to get too carried away here because I want to be done by now. And you probably want me to be done too. Bringing every thought, your mind, what is the enemy's greatest spot that he does affect you in? Your mind. He tempts you and he tries you and he pushes you and he, he throws all that stuff out at your mind and it's your mind made up that's going to keep you from crossing those lines. So we, br we bring those thoughts into the captivity of the obedience of Christ, that word obedience. I want, to, I want to close in obedience. The obedience of Christ, being faithful, doing what we're supposed to do, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Obedience, faithfulness, doing the right thing. Here's, here goes the phrase I hadn't used this one in a while. Let's throw it up here right now. To do the right thing just because it's the right thing. How about how we, how we try that? Let's live that way for a while. Do the right thing just because it's the right thing. Well, who said it was the right thing? My Bible. Not my pastor. Not my superintendent. Not, not the assemblies of God. It's the right thing because the Bible says it's the right thing. Now, if the assemblies of God happens to line up with that, wonderful. We'll say the assemblies of God says. But if what the assemblies of God says isn't Bible, then it's worthless. It's, it's pathetic and it's ridiculous. And one of the reasons I am assemblies of God today is because I feel pretty confidently that what our statement of fundamental truth is and all the things that we believe and what we do is scriptural. Everything we have is scriptural. Everything that I can find. If I found something that wasn't, I promise you, I pray, you probably wouldn't be talking to me this morning. Or we'd all stick together and change the name of this church. Well, there's no reason to do that because I believe we're standing on the word. And I don't have any question about that. Bottom line is this right here. Romans chapter 1. Here, here's where we need to live. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to what? Unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first also, for the Greek, for in it, excuse me, in it, eventually I'm going to say it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as they're written, here's the key right here, the just shall live by faith. Neighbor, we've got to wake up to that realization right now and live that right now, every day of our lives, to live in faith. To live in faith is to live in victory. To live in faith is to live in the promise of God. To live in faith is to be Every day, who we are to be in Christ, that obedience that is talked about at the end of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 there, or that passage in chapter 10 rather, that, that, that issue is obedience, it's faithfulness. Why are we obedient? Because what the Word of God says is what we need. And I've read the Word, and I've looked at the Word, and i said, this is, this is how I should function. This is how I should operate. This is who I am. This is my victory. And in my victory, I can't be defeated. Now watch that. Go back a while ago when I was talking about this, this crazy basketball game if we went into that with this formidable team all of us playing against them if we went into that with the heart and the mindset that says you know what we've already won we can't lose we won't lose and we went into it with that confidence and that attitude it's a game changer literally in that case a game changer but how much of the time do we get up in the morning and we feel defeated when our feet hit the floor. 
It's going to be a bad day today. It's going to be a rough day today. I've got to go to work today, and I've been dealing with this, that, and something else, or this co-worker, or that, that boss, or that doctor, or that nurse, or that bus driver, or that whatever I'm trying to think of, that, that patient that I drive where I'm going, you know, that, that, that client that I've got to drive down the highway. There, it's, just, it's going to be a bad day. And you just walk around. It's going to be a bad day today. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's just going to be so rough. Guess what's probably going to happen? It's going to be a bad day. Surprise. But why don't we just get up in Christ and just step out of our bed in the morning with a skip in our steps say, it's going to be a good day today. I know I'm facing trouble. I know I'm facing the boss that's a jerk. I know I've got a pastor that's going to preach too long this morning. I know it's going to be that way today. But bless God, he's not telling me anything I don't need to hear. He doesn't milk this too bad most, of the, most Sundays. It's going to be a good day. And if he didn't say it, if he didn't say it, it's because I didn't need it. And I'm just telling you this morning, this is our victory in Christ. It's to live in victory. And to approach every day like we are able to go attack hell with a water pistol if we choose to. Instead of going around their tail tucked between their legs like we've been whipped too much. Or not enough. Come on somebody. It's time to live in victory. And do it every day of our lives. And I've not even got, I've not even got to the good part yet. Can you imagine that? This is just the good, this is the good stuff. We didn't got down to the meat of this thing yet. Once we start talking about the individual aspects of our armor, by the time we get through this series, sometime, sometime in the next hundred years, I'm telling you something, if you, can't, if you can't get out of bed every morning with a spring in your step and with faith and trust in God in a way that maybe you never had before, then, then you, you missed it. Because I'm telling you, I know where I'm going with this. It's already got me fired up. I'm excited about it. Father, in the name of Jesus, today you know every one of us. You know our struggles. You know our trials, our temptations. You know what the enemy tries to use against us when he does perk up and try to do something? But Father God, all of that is pointless. All of that is, should fall flat to the ground and should have no impact on us whatsoever. And where it does, God, it's a choice we've made. It's a decision we've made. We've allowed ourselves to be put in bondage. We've allowed our allowed strongholds to be built up around us by our own choices, our own determinations. Father, help us to tear those things down. Help us, Lord God, to overcome uh, ourselves. And overcome the, the things that the enemy does try to do. Lord, we don't deny that he's active and working. Father God, but we, de we deny his power. And we know according to your word that he is disarmed, he is stripped clean, he is naked, and has nothing to use against us. And today, Father God, we claim that victory. And I believe for every person the sound of my voice this morning in this room and on the, on the internet today, God, to find that place to live in victory. To live in victory day in and day out. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing. Lord God, that the enemy has no authority, has no power, has no control. And cannot do anything that we don't allow him to do. And that's the good news and the bad news both at the same time. Touch us and help us this morning. Show us your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, please. Eyes closed. I'm going to ask two different questions this morning. The first and most important is, do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? And if he is not, and today you'd say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I need Jesus in my heart. I need to rededicate my life, whatever be the case. If that's you in the room, would you lift a hand and say, pray for me, I need Jesus in my heart and I want to ask him into my life today or rededicate myself today. Online, those the same question. Do you know Jesus in your heart? If you don't today, then I would ask you in a moment to pray a prayer with me that I'm going to lead you in just because I don't have the way to know whether you raised a hand or what have you. So I want to lead you in case you have, and you may see this years from now here on YouTube and you may find, you may have this message and I want to give you this opportunity so I want to do this quickly, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask a question of everybody in just a moment. Let's pray this prayer. And if you need to pray this prayer in the room, need to pray this prayer online with us, please do so. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that my victory is in you. And I ask you today to forgive me of my sin, to be the Lord of my life, and help me to walk in victory every day and to walk the life that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us if we pray that prayer from our hearts and we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we are saved, and your name is written down in heaven. So uh, congratulations if you prayed that prayer, and I believe God is going to bless you and touch your life in a way that you've never known before. And um, I'll share something in a moment after we, after we get to, toward the conclusion that, that you can share with me if you did that. Now the other question is this. What is your struggle? Now, I'm not asking to raise, I'm not going to ask for a hand raise. I'm asking you to think about, I'm, this is a self-inventory moment, if, you'll, if you will, where you're going to think about, and you're going you're gonna to just take a moment do you have a struggle? If you don't, wonderful. Praise God. Uh, but what do you struggle with? What do you have a hard time with? 
And I can throw out all kinds of things of lust and temptation and bad language and uh, whatever. All kinds, there's all kinds of junk that I can throw out. And I may throw out a dozen things and never even come close to what you deal with. But I just want to ask you this morning, what is it in your life that, well, it's, okay, I got it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What is it that makes you feel defeated? What is it in your life that makes you feel defeated? Is it, I'm not praying enough, I'm not praying at all, I'm not reading my Bible at all, I'm not this, I'm whatever, something that you're not doing. And what is there things maybe you are doing that make you feel defeated? Have you ever asked yourself, looked in the mirror, or even just asked yourself the question, why did I do that? Why did I say that? What is wrong with me? You're not alone. You're not damaged. You're not bad. God doesn't look at you and say, I about had it with that one. You're human. Jesus died for humans. Jesus died because of human behavior. So if you're going to live in victory, now let's, get our, let's find that place. If we're going to live in victory, you need to approach whatever situation that you struggle with, whether it's something you're not doing or something you are doing, with, I'm going to live in that victory. I am going to begin to do the things I should be doing. I'm going to stop doing things I shouldn't be doing, and I'm going to live in victory. And that's the choice that you're going to make. That's the choice that I'm going to make. And every human being on this earth has got to make that choice for themselves. It's not easy. It's not just cut and dried. And where you may today, you may have the victory over that thing. And I mean, you may just think, I'm never again crossing that line. I'm never doing that again. I'm never thinking. I'm not even going to think about it. You may wake up tomorrow morning. That may be all that hits your brain. That may be how everything in your life may just zoom, just come right back to that. And you, just, and you don't even know why. Let's give it to Jesus. Let's find that obedience I was talking about a while ago. Be obedient to God's word. Be obedient and faithful to what the Holy Spirit is guiding us in. Because the great news about the Holy Spirit, what he does, and this, this, I'm, uh, this may get into what I'm going to talk about in the weeks to come, but I want to throw it up right here. Remember what the Holy Spirit, one of the Holy Spirit's main jobs. He's there to convict us of righteousness, uh, or excuse me, of judgment, righteousness, and, 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 and sin. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought just for a second. He's there to convince us of what we need in Christ. Let him convince you. Let him show you. Let him help you. Because too much of the time we're quenching the Spirit instead of embracing. And we've got to watch that. That's dangerous. So my closing prayer is going to be, God help us. Help us to overcome. Help us to do what we should. Help us to not do the things we shouldn't do. And to live in victory. It's that simple. And what does that mean to you? Here's what I want it to mean to you. That today... You're going to pray along with me and, and, and agree with me in prayer and that for the rest of your life, until Jesus takes us home, you're going to do your best to live that, to be what you should be in Christ, to stop letting the enemy get over on you, to stop letting junk get in your way, and to stop letting yourself get in your way. I'm going to do it. I want you to do it. And I hope that you will take that stock and take that inventory and look at your own life and say, I am going to live my victory. And as this gets better, I'm telling you, they're, they're, what, I know what's coming in the weeks to come, and I'm, I just believe God's about to do something around here that, that maybe he's never done for some of us. And uh, I, I don't say that lightly either because I know God's done a lot of great things for all of us. Stand with me this morning. And join me in this prayer today and believe God to make it so in your life. Father, I believe today for the victory. The victory is, is already sealed. It's already done. The enemy has been disarmed, stripped bare, clean, put on display. And Father God, our victory is in our, in, our, in our own decisions, our own choices. Our victory is in our faith. Our victory is in our obedience. Our victory is in our trust in you, Lord God, to help us to do the things we should do and to not do things we shouldn't do. And Lord God, to, to, to live that victory day in and day out is not an easy thing. We may struggle. We may fall flat on our face. But when we do, your grace, your mercy, and your love is there to pick us up, dust us off, pull us out of the miry clay, and set us back on the rock. I believe today, Lord God, is a day of victory. I pray, Lord God, that any and all of us in this room today that have those struggles of sinful things or things we're not doing. I mean, James even said that to know to do good and not do it, it's sin. So, Father God, whatever we're struggling, whatever we're having a hard time with, help us today to overcome. Help us today to be victorious in all that we do and to see the victory and not just hope for it and wish for it or desire it, but God to live it and to be everything you'd have us be in Christ. I thank you for it, Lord. I ask you to bless and be with us and go with us where we go and keep us safe, blessed, and encouraged. And we honor you for it and thank you in Jesus' name. I'll come back again to those that are watching online real quickly. Um, if you would um, let me know that you prayed with me today, 
ctagpastorgmail.com. You also catch us there on, the, on our website. And I'll leave you with our word that we try to leave you with every time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father God, be with us as we go. Keep us safe and well. Bring us back together tonight, God, to enjoy our time together here and study of your word. And we honor and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.